So as often as the case in the talks, um, I start at the beginning. And the beginning of the talk relates to the beginning of the search in a sense. It might not actually be the beginning of the search because we might have found ourselves in a movement for an extended period of time already, but at some point it makes sense for us to consciously ask ourselves a very important question, understand how important this question is, and then come up with a very good answer to that question and move forward from there. So the question is, what am I really looking for? I find myself seeking. If we are a seeker in life, meaning if life has made that happen. I'm a seeker. I may have been seeking for many years and maybe I haven't asked myself this very important question. What am I really looking for in practical terms? Because frankly, if this movement in life didn't deliver something tangible and practical, what would the point be? It really isn't about um, understanding something or um, a lot of things we believe it's about. It's about something very practical and tangible, something that makes a tangible difference in our life. And so we should ask the question so that we're clear on where we're heading. What am I really looking for in practical terms? If I, so I emphasize this a lot because it's not only the starting point, this question and the answer. This is something that can arise many times in, along the way just to bring us back on track. Because there'll be a lot of times that we feel a bit lost and disoriented and wonder what it's all about. And so then this question will pop up. The answer that we've understood for ourselves will pop up and we'll automatically find ourselves back on track. So without any further ado, what am I really looking for? And the suggested answer is that what we're really looking for, what everyone is looking for, whether they realize it or not, is happiness. But not happiness as we expect it to manifest. Not happiness through the means that we expect or that we've been pursuing. We think that happiness is to be found in outcomes. And it turns out that human happiness is not to be found in outcomes, but rather to be found through peace of mind. So happiness for the human being turns out to be peace of mind. And if we just leave it at that, and we say, oh, what I'm really looking for is happiness. And we're not clear that happiness isn't to be found in circumstance. Happiness isn't about outcomes. Happiness isn't about success or a lot of the other things that we're pursuing in life. Then we'll have an answer. I'm looking for happiness, but we might actually have the wrong idea of what happiness is, which means pursue for a long time something that isn't really what we're looking for. So once it becomes made clear that what we're looking for is happiness, and it's happiness through peace of mind, and we can't stop there, what's peace of mind? In practical terms, because it's a word or a phrase, peace of mind. In practical terms, peace of mind is the absence of the uncomfortableness that we can call suffering. So what we're really looking for is the end of suffering. And it's important to know that suffering, essentially, in practical terms, again, is an uncomfortableness with oneself. So we're looking for the end of an uncomfortableness with oneself. And that uncomfortableness with oneself manifests in the form of, sometimes, an uncomfortableness with the other. But when we really look at it, we find that what we think is an uncomfortableness with the other, ultimate translates back, and we find it's an uncomfortableness with oneself. So once 
we're clear on that and not intellectually this is really a question that's easy for us to go away with and contemplate so straight away we might say is it really important this is is it really important for me to ask this question what am i really looking for and then you say well if i'm seeking it's good to have an idea of which direction to move in or what i'm being yes okay i see it's important for me to ask this question and then it's about asking the question correctly and getting the answer correctly so we're not looking just for an answer that we can write on a piece of paper a word that's often what we think answers are <coughs> this answer is an answer that we have investigated for ourselves thought of for ourselves and so when we come up with the answer it's not just a word it's a, it's a full understanding the full understanding says oh what i'm really looking for is happiness but the happiness is very specific not happiness through pleasure it's happiness through peace of mind and peace of mind is the end of suffering now all of these um components of this answer to the question we really need to be familiar with if we're going to say i'm looking for happiness happiness is peace of mind peace of mind is the end of suffering we need to know what suffering is we need to know on what basis it arises we need to understand on what basis it can cease as we understand this more and more in more and more detail what we find is we have an understanding about life that wasn't there before it turns out that the suffering that can end the suffering which when it ends is the state of happiness for the human being which is actually our birthright something that everyone is entitled to no one is missing anything it's the human being's birthright to be happy this because it turns out that happiness is not the gaining of anything but the simple removal of a functioning that turns out to be based on an error a misunderstanding so once the error misunderstanding is addressed is seen then the functioning that stems from that error has to stop it's sort of like <coughs> if you have light coming from a light bulb and you smash the light bulb there's no possibility for light to be there anymore the light was a consequence of the functioning of the light bulb so if we have a certain functioning that turns out to be based on false beliefs mistakes once those mistakes are removed then that functioning that output can't happen so that's the end of suffering when that happens so then we have to say okay am i sure that this suffering is an error am i sure that it's something that can end am i sure that this happiness that i'm looking for is something available so we can start off and this is all part of answering this question what am i really looking for we can start off by saying well <clears throat> the happiness that is being described the end of suffering is not something that i necessarily know on a continuous basis if it was i wouldn't be seeking it that's where we can start and so if we are, start, uh, are being very honest and sin sincere and practical we won't draw any wild conclusions we won't believe any concept so we'll say actually i'm not quite sure from my own experience whether this happiness is available but what we can do is become familiar with the unhappiness if it is there so we just need to wait for a period a day a moment when we can go to the experience put our hand on our heart and say in this moment what i know for sure is that i'm not happy and if we 
look at what is happening in the moment when we can say, hand on my heart, in this moment I'm not happy. What we'll find time and time again from our own investigation based on our own experience is that this unhappiness turns out to be an uncomfortableness. And when we look at the uncomfortableness, we'll find that there's a story related to circumstance. And the story or the uncomfortableness turns out not to be circumstance itself. The uncomfortableness is not the pain of a situation, but rather the additional attitude or story, relationship, that we have towards the situation. Now, because that attitude, we can call the attitude of doership and attachment to outcome. Until we start looking at it closely, we could be forgiven to make the mistake, or forgiven for making the mistake, that, no, I'm unhappy because of the circumstance. It's going to feel like that, because we usually feel unhappy unha when circumstance doesn't turn out in line with our preferences. And so it's very easy to make the mistake, to draw the conclusion, what are you talking about? Attitude. I'm unhappy because someone hasn't done what they said they were going to do. I'm unhappy because I failed as a parent this week, or I didn't consider my parents, or I forgot my sister's birthday, or I'm unhappy because I'm not performing at work. So it's very easy to think based on the feeling that it's got to do with circumstance. When we look more closely, we'll find that actually the uncomfortableness is not the circumstance itself. This is supremely important. If we keep thinking that we're unhappy because of outcomes, if we keep ha thinking that my uncomfortableness is outcome-driven, we'll never recognize that there is this extra layer of attitude. And the fact is that our uncomfortableness with oneself is always to be found on this layer of attitude. And the attitude that we can call uncomfortableness, the attitude we can call suffering, manifests in one of five ways. Guilt, blame, pride, worry and anxiety, expectation and attachment to outcomes. And the first three, guilt, blame and pride, are based on this deeply ingrained belief that I'm the doer and the other is the doer. The last two, worry and um, anxiety, expectation and attachment to outcomes, are based on the belief that my <coughs> completeness is dependent on outcomes. And so if we become interested in seeing what is going on when I can put my hand on my heart and say, I, in this moment I'm unhappy, we'll start to see this phenomena of the attitudinal arising, meaning the um, relationship that we have attitudinally to what is happening, and we'll see that at the base of that attitude there is either guilt, blame, or pride based on the belief that I am the doer and the other is the doer, and an attachment to outcomes and a concern and or a concern for what might happen in the future. And as we investigate this for ourselves, investigate means as awareness lands on these dynamics for ourselves. Just when it does, it, it doesn't matter if we miss 10 of these opportunities. On the one time that awareness lands on it and ticks off and says, yes, in this moment, the unhappiness appears to be because of someone having let me down. But in fact, I find that the letting down, sure, wasn't um, ideal, but we can call that pain in the moment. 
the real uncomfortableness is the blame or the hatred, the resentment towards the person for having let us down. The attitude where we see the other person as solely responsible for their actions, being in complete control of what they do in each moment. Essentially, we see the other and ourself as the orchestrators of life, meaning you and me and everyone else are the ones that have the power to decide how life looks in each moment. So, with that deeply ingrained belief, which is the belief of personal doership, we can't help but have this attitude. And with that attitude, automatically, when the other does something that hurts us, bang, we blame them. And that's the uncomfortableness. Now, seeing this is great. It's not about changing it just yet. The change happens on its own if it's destined to happen. Because on the very basis I've just explained that you and I are not in control of how life looks. We're not in control of how life brings about change on an attitudinal level. We're not in control of how life brings about circumstance. <laughs> However, if we find, even when we're not in control, if we find that we see things, that we understand things, then we can appreciate that the awareness landing on these dynamics, the seeing, the appreciating, the understanding is a happening. It's part of life. And so there's no need to be pessimistic that we're not in control. We can see our oh, life is showing me, life is bringing about a movement of recognizing these dynamics, of being interested. And the more that <clears throat> a movement that was previously unknown to be two parts, the more that that movement becomes seen as circumstance and attitude. Circumstance, which we can call the flow of life. It is, circumstance is always either pleasure or pain. The flow of life is always pleasure or pain. And then the attitude to the flow of life. So our attitude is outside of the flow of life. <coughs> it is an attitude towards the flow of life. So the flow of life is if a bird comes swooping down and nips us on the head because we're flying under its nest or something like that. That's circumstance. Our reaction to that, if we protect ourselves, that too is part of the circumstance, part of the biological movement. Very important. If we shout because we get a fright, that's part of the biological movement. And because we have biological preferences, and those preferences are for pleasure and not for pain, when the bird nips us, and let's say it's painful or it gives us a fright, we can say that's pain in the moment. And all of that is part of the flow of life. If the attitude then kicks in, an attitude that blames the wildlife officer for not having come and removed the bird and his bird's nest because you've reported it as a hazard to them for the last three weeks in a row. And the blame towards the bird, blame towards the wildlife officer, maybe even guilt or shame towards oneself because you forgot to keep an eye on the bird. You, you keep saying to yourself, each time I walk in this area, remember to take, keep your eye on the bird. Keep your eye for the swooping bird. And you forgot. So all of this is one's attitude to the circumstance that is happening. And it's on that level that we feel uncomfortable. So there's the level of the flow of life, the level of pleasure and pain, the level of circumstance. And that is out of our control. It's part of 
the life flow, love, life force that's happening. And our biological reaction is part of the flow of life. Also, our biological reaction, not in our control, based on our genes and up-to-date conditioning in each moment. And the attitude that we have, which can extend horizontally in time and continue well after the situation has actually finished, well after the circumstance has finished. That attitude towards the other, blaming them as the doer, towards oneself, blaming um, us as oneself, and not being able to reconcile that the outcome was a certain way because we believe that the outcome is integral to my completeness. That attitude is the uncomfortableness, the unhappiness that when we're looking out for it, we'll say, yes, in this moment, I'm not happy. And then we hear the concept, which incidentally, these concepts, if we open any wisdom teachings from a huge range of traditions, we'll find that what's being said here is being said over and over in many different traditions, maybe with less emphasis on certain points. But when we look in, read in between the lines and we look wide enough with an interest, we'll find, oh, this is not new. This is being um, uh, reported to us and we're being told about this everywhere. This information is everywhere if we look. So as we start investigating this and feeling the uncomfortableness, then the notion comes in, ah, oh, your happiness is never to be found in the flow of life. Your happiness is never to be found in outcomes. That means that outcomes are either pleasure or pain. And sure, pleasurable outcomes are nice. So it's not saying push away pleasure. It's saying, relate to pleasure, relate to outcomes, relate to what happens out there, relate to the way that others treat you, relate to the results of your actions for what they are. Outcomes in the flow of life, part of circumstance, either pleasurable or painful. Don't expect your completeness to be delivered because of circumstance, because of outcomes, because of what the other does. And then this ties back to what are you really looking for? And it might dawn on us, oh, I've always been seeking happiness in the form of outcomes and teachings, wisdom teachings that have been handed down for thousands of years have been telling me your happiness is never to be found out there. Your happiness is to be found inside, meaning your happiness isn't to be found in outcomes. And when we look at it, we see, wow, I'm so deeply conditioned to believe that happiness is to be found in outcomes, that I'm insisting attitudinally that the other acts a particular way. And what way do I insist that the other acts? I insist the other acts in a way that will deliver pleasure to me. I insist that the other will act in a way that is in line with my expectations. Now, how are we possibly going to expect all of the others out there to function exactly the way we would like them to? It's completely unrealistic. They're going to want to function the way they want to. So unless my um, ideal of how they function happens by some strange coincidence to match the way everyone else chooses to function, I'm going to be disappointed. And so that's where this good news comes and says, hey, your happiness isn't to be found out there. You don't need the other to act exactly the way you'd like them. You don't need life to turn out the way that um, you think it needs to turn out. 
Your happiness is to be found in your attitude to the flow of life, not in the flow of life itself. So then we ask ourselves, so what is this attitude that I currently have to the flow of life? That is an attitude that is creating my uncomfortableness rather than a comfortableness or a peace with the flow of life. And when we answer the question, we find, oh, my current attitude is the attitude of personal doership and attachment to outcome. Now, my attitude, what I'm talking about, attitude stems from essentially a deeply ingrained image of who I am, who the other is, and what life is. When life unfolds, we have an idea of what life is. And the idea of the idea we have of life, the idea of how I fit into life and essentially who I am and who the other is, turns out to be really quite off the mark compared to how we can come to see ourselves and the other. So the idea is I'm a separate independent entity in a world and I'm in control of what I do during the day. The other is in control. And so when all of us are doing what we are in control of, that's how life unfolds. That's how life turns out. Whereas the alternate way of seeing it is to come to see oh, that what I am and what the other is is intrinsically one with this very large unfolding of life very broad that started a long time ago and that I have grown into and part of life that I'm an organism that has grown essentially from the time I was conceived and at each moment I've been grown into a specific form and in each moment I'll function exactly according to my makeup that life this big flow of life this movement of life determines dictates i'm shaped by life and it's not really a complicated concept it's complicated actually it's not complicated it's difficult because it butts up against the deeply ingrained idea that I have about who I am and what life is. And so we might think, well, this, you know, this is just a concept. Or, no, this isn't how life is. Life is the way I know it to be. I think that um, the explanation makes a lot of sense when we look at it. One of the um, parts that makes it seem unrealistic is that as part of what I've been grown into, there is a sense, a feeling that I am separate and independent and autonomous. And there is a sense that I control my thoughts. And for as long as the fact that our thoughts arise and then we become aware of them after they have arisen as a result of a biological movement, as a, lo as a result of a very complex brain, for as long as that's not seen and we keep thinking, I'm the one I am the entity that produces my thoughts. I can choose what thought I will have next. And therefore, because I'm the chooser of my thought, I then can say that I'm the chooser of my action because action usually um, follows the thought. And if awareness lands on the fact that the thought is a result of, from one perspective, the causal perspective, a thought is a result of a brain that is 
hugely complex. The workings of the brain and the way that um, the brain develops and learns and then functions is absolutely beyond our control. It's beyond our comprehension by and large. And even if we did understand it, what we would understand is that I don't do it. I don't do all of the processing that happens in order for me to see the tree. I don't do all of the processing that happens when someone asks me a question. Would you like to go for a walk? I mean, this is the amazing thing. Someone asks a question, would you like to go for a walk? Sound comes in. And the brain has been developed to a point that it distinguishes the different sounds. It can isolate sounds and know, okay, that's the voice. And then it can understand the, v the sounds relative to a set of language that is all part of the brain and has been essentially the brain that has been developed to have those capacities. And then as a result of processing that information, the brain has the ability to analyze and respond and create outputs. And that's all happening. And if we had the experience, and some of us have had the experience just because of medical conditions or something like that, if we have the experience where the brain just stops working as it normally does, we can see the craziness that can happen, how we might not be able to comprehend what something is. We can see it, but we have no comprehension of what it is. There are, you know, experiments where certain faculties of the brain are closed off or connections in the brain have been severed between the left and right brain and the person can't recognize um, certain objects or can't put words onto them, but can function with them. There's all sorts of amazing examples that show us that the brain is this intricate um, machine that as soon as it changes, what we know as me changes. So we might come to see, oh, what I am, the me, the, the, not only the me, but the whole experience, is not... The controller, I'm not in front of the brain. I'm an output of the brain. What's speaking now? Who is speaking? The brain is producing output according to its development, its design. And then a component of the brain, which we can call the thinking mind, a component of the brain that has been conditioned to not see its own movement correctly, thinks that it, so it's a belief, a, an output of the brain says, oh, what, so this belief says, I, it's a belief, I control the brain. So an output of the brain says what I am is the controller of the brain. And doesn't recognize that it is an output of the brain. For as long as the thought believes it is the controller of the brain, it will then think that whatever happens after the thought as a consequence, as an um, effect of a previous cause, and in this case, the effect of a thought, the thought will continue to claim ownership over all the other movements. 
that follow the thought. So then it's like, well, I thought that it was a good idea f to go for a walk, and I went for a walk. So I chose to go for a walk, and I chose to go for a walk, and I forgot the iron on. And the house burnt down. So I'm responsible. Now, the fact is that we are on some level going to be held responsible for those actions that happen through us. We can't say, I'm not the doer and expect that there are going to be no consequences to actions that happen through the body. What is important is for an attitude to sit in, to set in, that recognizes that what happens in each moment is not as much my doing as I, as I previously thought. And as that attitude dissolves, the old attitude that is, that is convinced that I, as a human being, am a separate independent entity with complete volition. So there's this idea that there is a me in the head controlling how everything happens. So as that belief diminishes, life is allowed to continue more or less as it did before. The body will continue to function. The brain will continue to function. However, the part of the brain that used to claim ownership, used to judge oneself as um, the doer and judge oneself as having acted appropriately or not, and then felt uncomfortable because of the way circumstance turned out. The part of the brain that judges the other is um, being the doer in control of what happens and blames the other. That starts to dissolve. And what we find is that life carries on more or less the same. The body doesn't suddenly um, become incapable of understanding language. The body doesn't become incapable of using a knife and fork and talking, all of that is on the biological level. All of that continues to happen. It was always happening based on the same principle, based on our genes and up-to-date conditioning. All that changes is our relationship to what happens. The relationship is now one of, what we can say, non-doership, a relationship that witnesses everything happening as an arising in a body-mind organism. The thoughts arise in a body-mind organism. The feelings arise in a body-mind organism. Life unfolds through many body-mind organisms. And what we're looking for, what is available, is happiness in daily living. Happiness in daily living turns out to be peace of mind in daily living. Daily living turns out to be interhuman relationship. So what we're really looking for is peace of mind in interhuman relationship. And that simply means the deep, deep understanding that I'm not the doer, the other's not the doer. That the interactions, the interrelationship between me and the other are unfolding as destined. Sometimes it's going to be pleasurable. Sometimes it's going to be painful. But on an attitude, on a level of attitude, there's an equanimity with what happens. An equanimity on the basis that we understand that life is unfolding and it's unfolding the only way it can, which is according to God's will and not my will. I'm not the doer. I'm a consequence and I'm part of this wonderful, mysterious flow of life. With this attitude that witnesses life as a happening, witnesses life as in large part arising through a body-mind organism, with that 
with that attitude in place, we still function as a human being. but with a witnessing perspective. So then we find that our attitude is no longer of doership and life is witnessed as a happening. A whole layer of thinking that used to be there because of this idea that I am the one that makes life happen. This psychological construct, the what we can say the doer, falls away. And so then really life continues to unfold as it did on a biological and circumstantial level. The body sees, finds itself in a situation and the body reacts according to its genes and up-to-date conditioning. The body performs whatever tasks it needs to based on its genes and up-to-date conditioning and the circumstance it finds itself in, as it always has. But now with the understanding that the outcome is not in my control, the functioning in the particular moment was a happening based on my genes and up-to-date conditioning. And there's a relaxation. There's an attitude that allows life to flow. And so if we go back to this question, what am I really looking for? And we remember at least the theoretical answer, the concept. What I'm looking for is happiness. And happiness is the end of suffering. And suffering is based on the belief in personal doership and attachment to outcome. And that belief in personal doership and attachment to outcome are errors that life has put in place, i.e. life has conditioned the brain, has developed the brain to function amazingly, to be able to recognize things, to be able to process problems, to analyze situations, to learn. It's also conditioned the brain to see life incorrectly on some level. And it's life that brings about a reconditioning on the level we can call the thinking mind, the level where the error exists. It doesn't, we don't end up being deconditioned human beings. If we were deconditioned, it would mean that all our language skills would be removed. All of our capacity to wash ourselves and to drive a car and to go running and to walk. All of that is part of our conditioning. And that conditioning is biological and it causes no problems. It's what allows us to function in life. So the change happens on the level of the brain. The brain gets reconditioned in the area that we can call the thinking mind, the part of the brain that has seen itself as something it isn't, seen itself as a separate entity in control. Why is the brain, why is the person not a separate entity? It's very simple, is that we arise never independent from life. We're born into life. means there's no separation between the baby and the life moment it is in. And the baby is continually being affected by the circumstance that they are in. Meaning they are never separate. They're never independent. They're completely one with the momentary experience of life. Life is impacting them moment after moment after moment. And so the growing baby, the adult, is a result of everything 
that came before. So the capacity to see, the capacity to think, is not an independent capacity. It's not a capacity that exists separate from anything. It's, it's, it's not a capacity that would be there if there was a separation. So, hopefully we can drop the idea that I am going to be, as a human being, a deconditioned um, entity. The human, on a biological level, will always be conditioned. And the conditioning, especially what we could call the working mind, the functioning, functional conditioning, is hugely necessary. So now our attention can focus on the part of the programming of the brain, which we're referring to as the thinking mind, see that it's that which causes all the problem. It's the conditioning in the thinking mind that relates to what happens through the body as my doing and relates to the outcomes as being highly important for my completion. The why I say it's the thinking mind that's the problem is because it's true that the body could be conditioned in a way that it doesn't perform biological tasks very well. The body could have biological conditioning, let's say of language or of social skills that are not particularly highly tuned, let's say, or highly toned. Um, And so, let's say the person's language is not very good, or their capacity to work out numbers is not very good, and they make a lot of mistakes. Now, that's biological. That's That's going to lead to a result that we could say is not ideal um, relative to someone's preferences, maybe. They would prefer to get their numbers right and not suffer the consequences of giving someone too much money or something like that. But that's not the real problem. That turns out to be pain on the level of circumstance. And as long as the attitude towards that pain, the attitude of doership and attachment falls away, we find that it doesn't disturb our peace of mind. It doesn't disturb our comfortableness with oneself. The fact that we make an error and that there is an unfortunate outcome is something that we can very much live with even if that error is recurring. We can very much live with it as long as there is an acceptance that this is happening because the body is designed that way. I would prefer that it didn't happen. I can do my best in each moment to improve the situation. I can do my best to um, learn more, to get new conditioning from life that might change my biological reaction. But once I've done that, once I've tried to learn mathematics better, for example, I know the outcome's not in my control. I can go to tutorials and I might find my mathematics skills increase or or not. Once I've done that, I accept the ongoing outcomes as biological, pleasure or pain. And with the correct attitude, I'll find I can very much live with the outcomes that are painful. They simply aren't taken personally. If we don't go through this, if I don't repeat this over and over as essentially new conditioning that life is throwing out to bring about change, then what's likely to happen is these dynamics are going to be overlooked. The notion that I'm really looking for something very practical, something very um, (laughs) available, 
might not be clear and we might find that the thinking of the working mind the contemplating the observation the investigation of our of our life experience uh, might be very different to what it is uh, when we get given very um you know specific focused pointers that keep you know stick within a range of this topic of happiness in daily living peace of mind in daily living which when it sets in we will know from our own experience that ah this actually is what i was always looking for i sought all sorts of things i spent half my life or three quarters of my life thinking that i was looking for happiness in outcomes and then at a certain time based on my genes and up-to-date conditioning uh interest in subjects like spiritual seeking kicked in changes happened and i find a change in attitude i find that there is a relaxation and suffering comes to an end and then i know from the self-confirming experience of life that i was never looking for fame success financial independence all of those things could be pleasurable or painful they're all part of the flow of life not that we want to turn them away if they are delivered especially if they're pleasurable if they're delivered and they're pleasurable we enjoy them if they're there and they're not pleasurable then we have to endure the pain the realization is ah i was never really looking for that that was never going to satisfy me on the level that is satisfying what i was looking for the only thing that satisfies is this ending of the uncomfortableness the ending of a certain attitude to life it turns out that it's the dawning of a connection to who we are it's a recognition that I'm never disconnected from source. The human being is or can be said to be the impersonal consciousness of source linked to a particular body-mind organism and functioning through that body-mind organism as personal consciousness. Personal consciousness is the experience that we're having, each of us are having right now. That that experience that you are intimately familiar with right now that that experience the whole thing the peripheral vision the attention on a stomach ache if it's there the attention on a joyous feeling or an uncomfortable feeling the thoughts about what's for dinner the thoughts about um <clears throat> everything that is in your momentary experience right now the sense of being an individual in a world or for that matter the uh, unique experience if it happens to be what comes in and goes of being not localized as a person in the world right? whichever it, it is is the personal consciousness experience so if you have the sense that you are not um the human being if there has been an awakening to this formless awareness we might because of the quality of that experience we might say oh that's impersonal awareness because it doesn't feel personal it's not impersonal awareness that's the personal consciousness experience it's the experience of life from the perspective of a particular body mind organism even if it doesn't feel like it's from the perspective of body you just need to put your hands over your eyes and you'll see that the experience changes 
it changes such that it makes it clear that even if it feels decentralized, even if it feels like consciousness isn't functioning through the body, you find that the body still plays a very pivotal role in your experience. You might want to experiment a little further and get a hammer and stick your thumb out on the table and whack it. And you'll see that the body plays a very interesting part in your experience, even if you feel that you're everywhere. You might like to extend the experiment, get one of your friend's thumbs, <laughs> stick it on the table and whack it. And see if that's part of your um, everywhere experience. And you'll find that <laughs> there'll be an experience of seeing the, the hammer hit the thumb, for example, but there won't be the sharp pain. There'll be the experience of your friend shout. They might thump you. And then you'll realize, oh, the body is actually very pivotal in my experience. And so the momentary experience, whether it feels personal or not, is a personal consciousness experience. It's impersonal consciousness of source functioning through a particular body-mind organism. And sometimes that personal consciousness experience has a very impersonal feel to it still a personal consciousness experience. And furthermore, just because I've mentioned this um, impersonal sense that sometimes happen where we um, come to believe that we're not the person, not the human being, that to me is a phase along the path towards peace of mind a phase that demonstrates the nature of life, demonstrates that life is an experience and that the sense of a human being can be seen to be <coughs> part of the experience. But nonetheless, the experience is there and that experience as it presents in each moment, we can call our personal consciousness experience. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I saw some, dyna some dynamics, how something happened. It was really interesting. That I saw dynamics that because of our, our biological reactions in the moment when the life puts us in a situation, and uh, when it's pleasant, we know what is pleasant. And sometimes when it's not pleasant, and we know what is pleasant, and because of that, knowing what is pleasant, our minds start to create a sort of thing, how to read of that and to bring the pleasant thing back, back again. And that is only the thought, the doer, which is cause of the problem, which cannot, which, like uh, the body knows what is pleasant thing, and when it's unpleasant, starts to create sort of um, behaviors to cut off the suffering and want again a pleasant thing which is circumstantial wants to find a circumstance to get um, in this yeah, something yeah <laughs> yes sure yeah. um, that's that's right if we're craving if we're craving circumstance to be a certain way based on the memory of how it can be yeah. and our experience of how it can be then we could very easily um, have that turn into um, a craving, a resistance to what is, because we have had experience that it can, in any moment, be different. We've had that experience. Um, and if that becomes the insistence, if attitudinally we insist that the pain in this moment be replaced by pleasure, thinking that we're in control of how life looks in each, each moment, it's going to turn into suffering. Um, it's important to note that the biological intelligence is still going to do what it can in 
a circumstance to change pain into pleasure. It's going to see that the temperature of the heater is high, for example, and it's very hot in the room. And so biologically, the body might go and turn down the heater. So once it's done what it can to fix the problem, it has to sort of see what the outcome is. He, the body might go to turn down the heater and find that the remote control isn't working. So the body has biologically done what it can and can't change the circumstance, can't make the room a uh, more pleasant temperature. And if the thinking mind kicks in and says, you know, yesterday this room was perfect, the, the temperature was perfect, and I want it this way now, which is something that it can't have because it's tried to bring about an adjustment in the temperature. It hasn't happened. And if it starts to insist, then that becomes a resistance to what's happening in the present moment. Um, <coughs> I'd, I'd like to focus on um, the difference between duality and dualism. Uh, and sometimes because um, in spiritual seeking, in spiritual paths, there is the path of non-duality, Advaita. Advaita in Sanskrit means duality. And in Sanskrit, if there's an A in front of a word, it means the opposite of it. So, Advaita, non-duality. Dvaita is duality. And so, we've most of us have heard of Advaita, meaning the path that is known as non-duality. And in that path, there's a lot of talk about um, non-separation, oneness, um, the end of duality, um, and w the expectation can set in such that when certain realizations happen, certain realizations of our true nature, let's say, or the nature of life, we can expect that duality is going to fall away. That what we um, might see is that the reality is non-duality and that what we've always taken to be real is illusory. And so in various paths, we're told that duality is error, duality is illusion and the real is non-dual in nature. Now this topic is a little tricky to address because as you've heard me say many times teachings are paths and different teachings exist and they employ different methodologies. And so what is being said in a teaching is never the truth a concept, a teaching methodology that is there in order to bring about required changes. And rather than mistaking the word duality and dualism and thinking that they are just the same thing, it's worth investigating or exploring the difference between duality and dualism and maybe even throw in non-duality in that discussion. When the recognition of one's true nature, which um, can be said to be not part of the flow of life, to be formless and not physical, and 
from one perspective, we can say that what we are is awareness and awareness is all pervasive and that the whole experience of life is completely interdependent on awareness and what I am is awareness and therefore the whole of life is completely one with what I am. There is no separation between myself as awareness and the experience of life or we could say the universe. The truth remains that after this realization life is continued to be lived by the sage and the experience of life continues to be one of duality. Now duality means interconnected opposites. Duality on the flow of life level on a circumstantial level means hot and cold, big and small, health and disease, wealth and poverty, male and female, up and down, summer and winter. And pleasure and pain. The fact is that they don't cease to be part of the experience of life. On an experiential level, duality very much remains part and parcel of life. If we think that that stops, we have an expectation of what the realization of non-duality is. We may actually be blinded by a belief that because I have realized something that was unseen and seen that there is no separation from a particular perspective, that everything is contained within this awareness that I am at my core, when that realization happens, we might suddenly believe that duality has ended. If we go to the experience, we'll find that, no, duality hasn't ended. You can have food that tastes good and food that tastes bad. You can have a flower that tastes that smells good and a, a flower that smells bad. You can have hot water and cold water. Find that on a biological level, the preferences are still there. On an experiential level, which is the biological is part of the experience level, life continues to be an experience of duality interconnected opposites. What has been realized is that the duality is part of a non-dual experience. In essence, what we come to note is that all experience fundamentally is non-dual in nature, meaning that the awareness that recognizes the experience is not separate from the experience itself. So regardless of whether the experience feels like a duality or not, regardless of whether the experience includes hot or cold in it, all of those differentiations, all of those interconnected opposites arise within a single awareness that is aware of the experience as a single momentary experience. That is a, an awakening to the nature of experience. And from that level we can say, experience is non-dual in nature. You can't not have a non-dual experience. It's simply not possible. You can't not have a non-dual experience. All experience is fundamentally non-dual, meaning what is recognized in the experience is not separate from the awareness that recognizes it. However, on an experiential level, 
you can have an experience that is designed to feel like oneness and an experience that is designed to feel an experience as duality and the way that the experience feels on an experiential level has nothing to do with your realization of non-duality. You can have a full re realization that the underlying nature of experience is non-dual and simultaneously have the experience on the surface of life of duality. Have the experience that what I am as a human being is separate from the other human being in experience. That I can have hot water or cold water. That there is big and small. I can be healthy or I can be unhealthy. All of these interconnected opposites on an experiential level. The experience is not one. It's differentiated. And if we think that the realization of non-duality suddenly eliminates all of the differentiation of experience, we've simply got it completely wrong. It becomes clear when we think about it, of course, the sage is still going to experience pain and pleasure. And that is duality, interconnected opposites. So the experience of duality continues. Dualism is different to duality. Dualism is a mental movement that creates a separation, creates uh, two-ness that isn't there. So dualism is not the experience, but the attitude to the experience. The dualism sees myself as the doer, separate and independent, sees the other as the doer, separate and independent, and then creates an attitude of competition and rivalry and anonymity, resistance between me and everything else, creating a separation, a mental separation that isn't there. And so if dualism falls away, meaning the thinking mind falls away, the experience of life is still an experience of duality. There will still be male and female, good and bad, health and disease, wealth and poverty. But now the fight, the attitude towards what is happening, if the dualism is there, is an attitude of resistance. This shouldn't be like that. This should be the way that my dualism says it should be. And if the dualism falls away, there is an attitudinal acceptance that life is a happening, a single movement, and that it's going to be the way it is. And so the attitude of dualism, the attitude of not this but that, I want it this way, not that way, or that way, not this way. And the other should act that way, not the way they're acting. I should act differently to how I'm acting. All of that is the attitude of dualism. The experience of duality continues even when dualism falls away. The, con the experience of duality continues even when there is a deep understanding of the non-dual nature of life, which is why the dualism falls away. This is um, something that's maybe not often talked about because of the subtlety. And if it's not talked about, we might go around thinking that this search is all about a shift in experience where the experience is non-dual on an experiential level. 
And if that's the case, we might practice and try and do mental acrobatics in order for the experience to change on an experience level and miss the point that what we're really looking for is something very practical. The end of suffering. And I remember being stuck in this position where I had had um, several, and one in particular, very strong um, oneness experience. And when that happened, the experience matched the non-dual pointings perfectly. And I became convinced this is enlightenment. This is a glimpse of enlightenment. And it's just a matter of it coming in a more stabilized form. And why did I come to that assumption? I came to that assumption because the experiential shift that happened was um, very different. It w seemed and was profound. And so our brain says, well, this shift happened because of all of the, um, you know, because there's a process underway, underway and the shift feels profound the sense of who I am um, was radically different in that experience. And then the brain concludes, well, that's what it's all about. And when it faded away, and as is bound to happen, there was at some point a craving for it to come back, a, a lot of work, um, to try and recreate it, um, wondering what what sort of thinking was um, out of line, trying to stop um, thinking. And because of that, we could say there was a suffering that crept in, a suffering that actually hadn't been there for a long time, much longer than the existence of the oneness experiences. In the oneness experience, there was a very profound sense of stillness and um, peace. And so, once again, the mind jumped on that and said, wow, that was very profound. And so, that clearly is what I'm after. Once the suffering came back in, afterwards when there was a craving for that profound experience to be there um, it occurred to me actually you might not be looking for that oneness experience you might not be looking for that profound peace that was felt in that oneness experience you might be looking for the very simple peace that you had before the oneness experience a piece that had set in because the process had already undone a lot of the suffering dynamics. And what I noticed is that because there was an expectation about what in this, this process and this shift was, an expectation that in hindsight turns out to be an expectation that is actually an obstacle and frankly not accurate. So it's a inaccurate expectation, basically an idea of what liberation is, which in my experience is not the case. So when that kicked in, that was more suffering. And so it became clear, oh, what I am looking for is the end of suffering that was by and large there before the experience happened and is now being disturbed by a set of thinking that has lost focus on what it's really looking for and has now focused on an experience that was profound and said, oh, I, I, I think I must want that. And if that was delivered and the profound peace remained, so if that was delivered on a continuous unbroken basis and the profound peace remained, well, I guess maybe I'd take that. 
if you asked me now, would you take the peace of mind, the end of suffering in the form that it exists for you now? Or if you had the choice, would you swap it for that experience you had and let's say will extend that experience forever? There's no way, hand on my heart, I can look you all in the eye, that there is this, there's not the smallest chance that I would say, oh, okay, I'll have that experience extended indefinitely in exchange for the peace of mind that exists now. The peace of mind, which is simply the end of suffering, while the experience of life is still very much an experience of duality, the experience of a person living in a world, the experience of pleasure and pain, right? yet with the attitudinal acceptance, which is simply the absence of the attitudinal non-acceptance that used to be there. Right? There's not the smallest chance I can make the decision in less than a tenth of a second. No, I won't swap. Go on, that was so profound. Um, you can have it and it will be extended. I, I don't know. That was as far... I, I don't know what that was. Right? How, why would I want it I had it for I don't know what it was 15 minutes and I don't know what it would be like to have it forever it was good as for 15 minutes um, there wasn't much of a Roger there the, the person wasn't there it was a completely mm, impersonal experience of life from a perspective out there actually I think I'd miss Roger and the Rogerness Maybe after half an hour or after 10 days, something would feel like it was missing in that state that was there. It was profound. But what I do know is that what, I, what is here now, the end of suffering, is profound. And it's simple. And it's ordinary. And it's simply the end of a certain faculty of thinking based on ingrained beliefs that life put in place, ideas that with enough information, enough guidance, enough um, interest from ourself and contemplation and good luck, can very easily dissolve. Just like the sanding back of layers of paint on a door. It's, it's simple physics. The dissolving of these ideas is simple physics. It's life delivering new conditioning that delivers contemplation, that leads to contemplation, that leads to conclusions, that lead to the undoing of erroneous ideas that cause suffering. It's not complicated. Just like the rubbing down of a door and removing the layers of paint is not complicated. It can take some time. It's happening. You know, if you've let, removed 80% of the paint on a door and you've been rubbing at it for 10 hours, you might think at some point, you might stop and think, I'm not getting anywhere. The door still has paint on it. And in fact, what could, have, could be happening is you've removed 80% of it and there's only a little layer left. And when you look at it, go, I can't see the wood. I, I don't know that anything's happened. So the process, although you know, the analogies you know, always got its limitations, the fact is that if you see lots of paint dust everywhere and when you're sanding, you see the paint coming off and in sections you see the wood coming through and you can see that you're getting closer in, in parts oh look at that, no more paint in the same way the spiritual sh journey is like that, you start getting glimpses, periods of peace of mind you start seeing the dynamics of thinking that we were heavily identified with and had no idea were based on error we start seeing them as error they don't necessarily stop straight away they start getting cut off. They'll get cut off 
quicker and quicker and quicker as the understanding goes in deeper and deeper and deeper. And even when the understanding is very deep, there's going to be periods when it's destined for loads of suffering to be coming out. So, no way will I um, opt into that sort of impersonal oneness experience. Don't want it. Did I make that clear? Like, I don't want an impersonal, dissolved oneness experience. I think it would be terrible after a fairly short period of time. We all know this because we have um, uh, um, mild versions of this. When these shifts happen and the witnessing kicks in and there is the sense of the individual dissolving and there's a great relief that comes with it because what dissolves as well as the sense of the, the person and the... Um, yeah, being the person, what dissolves with that is all the suffering. Right? And it feels like a relief and it feels like, ah, oh, this, is, this is beautiful, this is open and free. And we might not be thinking that at the time um, because in that dissolved state there isn't mm, much of the person there. And then we k get dragged back into the person again and it feels uncomfortable so we draw the conclusion ah that pesky person is here so um remembering the process is about the non-duality and the impersonal and the oneness so we work at getting back to that and we find ourselves going in and out reinforcing the idea that the answer is no person um Whereas it might not actually be that whatsoever. Mm. Um, and if we find ourselves out there for long enough, remembering it feels wonderful at first because what has dissolved with that experience of the person is all the suffering. And it's a huge breath of fresh air. The breath of fresh air is the spaciousness from the contracted uncomfortableness with oneself. But then after a while, things start to get a little dry. Things start to um, feel a little odd, like something is missing, something's not quite right. And the reason that kicks in is because something isn't quite right. That's not what liberated living looks like. That's not where life takes us in the very... Life takes us back to being the person, but not the person with the load of suffering and the load of uncomfortableness, the person without the load of suffering. And when we think about it, why the, the no person experience felt so good is because the suffering dissolved. It's like, ah, that's it. What if we can have the person experience, but without the suffering? That's what clicked in me when I realized, when Ramesh, said, you're not looking for a oneness experience. I said, well, I think I might be looking for a oneness <laughs> experience. Um, and so after describing, he said, Roger, don't worry about it. That was just an experience. I said, I, in my head, it's like, that wasn't just an experience. That was the most profound thing that's ever happened to me. And in fact, it matches everything that is being told to me about what this shift is without me realizing that Everything that was being told to me was part of my process, part of a phase, part of what was needed in order to get everything to where it needed to go, including the realization, oh, so a few months later, oh, what if he's right? What if I'm not looking for a oneness experience? What if what I'm looking for is the end of suffering? And what if the end of suffering is available in my person experience, in the experience of duality? And I, I said, I didn't have to say, what if? I said, it is. I have it. It was only interrupted by very mild suffering at that time. And then this profound experience, which I, I, I said, this is just the, 
this is the culmination, this is, this is it. And then what came in is a sort of more um, intense suffering than I had been used to for a while. And when I landed on that, and I thought, ooh, this, and why is this here? Because I have this expectation. And then it was, what if he's right? <laughs> Clicked. I'm not looking for oneness. I'm looking for happiness in daily living as the human being. So, we can make the distinction. We're not looking for the end of duality. We're looking for the end of dualism. We're not looking for a state of non-duality. We're looking for the realization that life is a happening and I'm not the doer, the other isn't the doer and a connection to our true nature, a connection to the heart that informs me that in each moment I'm not separate from source i'm not disconnected from source that so whatever happens through me the words happening through me the words happening through everyone else the movement happening through me and everyone else that's source functioning through all of us so there is an intimate connection with source at each moment because there is a recognition of the functioning which can't happen unless i'm connected to source so my connection to source remains unbroken what I'm talking about source here when I say my connection to source is a connection to the sense I am, I exist as a person, as a human being. And Ramesh would say the, the sage is the ego. The sage doesn't have an ego. Everyone is the ego. The ego is the person. The ego is the personality and the preferences. And the ego doesn't dissolve. What dissolves is the belief in personal doership and attachment outcome. So we start off being an ego with the belief in personal doership and attachment to outcomes. We go through a process whereby the beliefs in doership and attachment to outcome get dissolved and we end up realizing, oh, I still am a an ego. I don't have an ego. I am an ego. But now uh, there's an ego without the belief in personal doership and attachment to outcomes, meaning an ego that understands that what it is, the person, what the other is, another person, is the one impersonal consciousness of source linked to this particular body-mind organism, the vehicle, the body, functioning as personal consciousness, which is the experience of being a person. And that's life. Is the, I think it's a Chinese saying, be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. So the, mm, the moral of that, or what that saying is, is trying to highlight to us, is that if you're not clear on what you're seeking, you might find yourself seeking the wrong thing. And if you seek the wrong thing, you might find yourself on a path that's taking you round and round in circles. You might find yourself on a path that is wishing for something that you don't actually need. Wishing for something that won't actually satisfy you. Be careful what you wish for, you might just get it. It means wish for the right thing. Or surrender 
to the fact that um, you don't know what to wish for. What I found at some point when some uncomfortableness would arise and the understanding was very deep because it had been the dynamics had been seen that suffering always arises based on this doership so at some point if the suffering was there i'd ask for some help like i my help a prayer essentially was very specific i said something like i don't really know what to ask for but it's pretty clear to me that the deeply ingrained belief in doership and attachment to outcome doesn't serve a purpose and creates a disconnection from source. So, to the best of my ability, I humbly offer <laughs> non-doership and put it on the table for you to do what you will with it. <laughs> and when I said that, I used to feel very confident that offering up the belief in personal doership and attachment to outcome, the attitudinal belief that basically separated me from source and when I felt connected to source, there was peace. I felt like that's a pretty safe thing i'm not telling you i'm just saying well i'm pretty sure this is not good and i'm pretty sure this keeps me disconnected so if it's appropriate here it is and attitudinally i also had this thing say like, i don't really know but from experience from observing this doership thing is uh, not a great asset. So every time we drop out of the thinking mind into a quiet being, which really means dropping into the heart, realizing that I can stop in the midst of even my functioning during the day. There's always, if the thought arises, just be. And then I realize, ah, this is the core of the human being. This is the I am, the sense of I exist. And I have to admit, I have no idea where it really comes from. What I like to um, feel is that this I am, the sense of I am, is my connection to source, is source in its manifest form which is the case for everyone. And I find that this sense of I am is in the chest area, in the heart, we could say, the spiritual heart. And if we allow the center of consciousness to drop out of the head into the body, if we allow the gaze to open up, soft gaze that allows everything to be as it is, allows the whole experience to be here, and we relax into being. I like to think that the heart is the junction point between the impersonal and the personal. What I can know is the impersonal version of the personal experience. I 
only ever have access to the personal experience, to the experience of being Roger. And if I drop into the core of the Roger experience, at the very core, because on the surface, the preferences are there, all the things that come and go, the thoughts, the um, visual experiences and the sound experiences, my idea of um, my age, a whole lot of things that are always coming and going, but they still make up the human experience. But when I drop into the core, I find, ah, I am is the core, and that is the impersonal aspect of the personal experience. And that's as far back as I can go to rest in being, to rest in the I amness of Rogerness. And the I amness is found in the heart. And so I like to think of the heart as the junction point, the junction box where impersonal consciousness bursts into personal consciousness. And on the other hand, because when we rest in this being, in the core of the human being, if we drop all the ideas, we also have to be open to the fact that I don't know where it comes from. It doesn't tell me where it comes from. I get to rest in it. I get to know it intimately. And I say, well, what if? What if it stems from the body? And I'm not connected to some universal source. I say, well, if that was the case, then, which is quite possible, my experience would be exactly the experience I know now. And if I am an expression of a universal consciousness, the experience will be exactly what the experience is. So it doesn't really matter where this I am source, this this the source of the human experience. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. What's important is to rest in it and appreciate its uniqueness, its timeless quality. And so that's the mystery of, that's the mysterious part of the human. When we drop down there, we don't find answers. And yet we don't need answers. There's a a self-contentedness that comes without answers. Mm.